afternoon, brothers and sisters, and welcome once again to the Self-Improvement Basis for Community Development Talk Show. I'm your weekly host, Brother James Muhammad. I'm honored to have on the show this afternoon all the way from Tulsa, Oklahoma. She took the drive here to Memphis to be on our show as we discuss the issue of the final call, women in prison. So, sister, you came a long ways. I appreciate that. Thank you. How was the drive? The drive was uh, awesome. Smooth highway, good highway. Good highway. Well, sister, we want to touch on this very critical issue. Women in prison, suffering and abuse. You have a particular story to tell, but before we get into your story, I want the people to know something about you and why it's so important that they get to know you first as a person before we get into your story. And I know you have told this story over and over again. My sister, have, she's an author of a book titled Begging for Justice. Also, she's been featured in the Rise magazine twice. So if you want to know more about her story, pick up the Rise magazine. Also, pick up her book. Where can they purchase this book at, my sister? Amazon.com. Amazon.com. All right, thank you, sister. This is my own personal copy that my <laughs> sister autographed for me, and I'm going to read it. I'm going to make sure your story get out. So my sister, uh, first of all, once again, thank you for coming on the Self-Improvement Basis for Community Development <coughs> Talk Show. Uh, tell us something about yourself and, uh, and what you know, would like the public to know about you. Thank you, uh, Brother James Muhammad, and thank you to the Nation of Islam. I'd like to thank the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan because the reason why I'm here today in front of uh, Brother James Muhammad is because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan answered a letter that I written to him in uh, 2004, and he heard my cry, and he answered me. And uh, out of all the people that I wrote begging for help, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan took time to drop me a letter and tell me to keep fighting, that God will, Allah will deliver, and he will not fail. And for those words of encouragement, Brother James Muhammad, it has kept me because uh, someone like the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to speak to a broken woman, women in prison are broken, they are uh, 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 abused, and so when you have someone like the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that takes the time to uh, encourage you to fight and never give up. That meant a lot to me. But thank you again for having me and to all my many supporters around the world, my brothers and sisters so strong in the nation. I just want to say thank you. I love you all so much. You all have given me purpose in life to continue to fight. Uh, it's not in me to ever quit. But you must say, if you be still long enough, it will be in. But I have not ever decided to ever quit because I know this journey, I promise family, friends, and many other abused women I would not give up. So I am Miss Pamela Smith. I am from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was born and raised in a small town of Cushing, Oklahoma. Growed up on family values. My grandfather was the first black policeman in Cushing, Oklahoma. I came uh, along with uh, law enforcement all in my family. I made a mistake and ended up in prison. I used to be on crack cocaine. I've been clean and sober for 26 and you're years. Sister. And thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> been clean and sober for 26 years. Came home. I'm the mother of one son. Uh, I was married to a military man. He just recently died. Uh, I was married 20 years to him, and he recently died. Uh, did 20 years in the U.S. Uh, Army. And so I thank God. Uh, I used to own businesses in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a Conoco station, a modeling agency called Pamela's Pretty Girls. Uh, most of all, I am a child of God. I stand on my faith. I know who I am. I know who I belong to. And so I have many family and friends. Uh, I was raised uh, with uh, eight of us in my family. I am the seventh child. And uh, I lost all of my sisters. It was four of us girls and I'm the baby girl left and so uh, I raised up with a uh, strict uh, rules and uh, I strayed away from those basic things in life but God always Allah always have a, a way of bringing you back to your basis but uh, I made a mistake and uh, I end up in uh, prison uh, as I said I was uh, 
I waited to get old to learn how to get high, something that I should have never ever did, but I was uh, encouraged, like we all have shortcomings in life, ain't nobody perfect. Nobody just fall from heaven, so we all have mistakes, but we make those mistakes by correcting them. And so uh, I ended up in prison for checks and credit cards. And while I was in prison, I was uh, on a work release program, Department of Public Safety and uh, Department of Correction that entered a contract. And when they entered a contract for female offenders to go out and work for them, I was an inmate at the Department of Public Safety while I cleaned as a janitor. And when I was there, was a state driver's examiner there by the name of Donald Reed Cochran Sr. And uh, he had uh, several times asked to see my breasts, all type of things uh, yes. to violate me, to degrade me. Uh, uh, just simply was hate is what it was, was a hate crime. But uh, he told me that uh, I had violated him, uh, that he had violated me. So. Uh, that's where I was at with that. Okay. Well, sister, first of all, for those who are just now tuning in to the self-improvement, basis for a community development talk show, I'm sitting here with my sister, Pamela Smith from Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, as we discuss women in prison, suffering and abuse. Uh, my sister's an author of Begging for Justice. Uh, my sister came all the way to Memphis from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now. We also have Facebook Live, so if we make any mistakes, <laughs> blame it on the head and not the heart, blame it on the mind, not the heart, <laughs> excuse me. But uh, I'm going to tell you, sister, I'm kind of nervous sitting here with you. All right. Why? Because this is a serious story. Very serious. Very serious. And it carries a lot of pain with it. And I hope our young people are listening to you because I'm, I'm glad that you talked about your childhood and how you strayed away. You was taught the right way, but you strayed away. Right. But everybody have faults. I thank Allah for keeping my closet shut because I'm gonna share something with you, sister. And most people know this about me. I got in trouble at one time. I was doing the same thing. You know, picking up little bad habits, messing with credit cards and things like that. So no one's in a position to judge, you know. So, but you have some untold suffering. You know, so now, once she was introduced into the uh, penal system, how long did you serve time, my sister? I served six calendar years. Six calendar years? Okay, now serving six calendar years, you were saying you had to go into a work release program, and that work release program was designed uh, for your reform and also uh, prepare you to go back out in uh, society, right? So in this work release program, that's when your abuse started, right? My abuse started in the year of November 1997. I had two sisters that died while I was working at the Department of Public Safety. Okay. The first sister got killed in a car wreck in uh, November 1997. And my other sister, Al died in uh, Easter Sunday of 1998. Mm. I was raped on my birthday, February the 6th of 1998 by the state driver's examiner in the storage room. Uh, I was also raped and tortured with a glass salt shaker to say goodbye to my sister that Friday morning. Mm. This is the first time that I have breaking this date other than to the lawyers. It's the first time I'm breaking news. The date I never told because I was raped on my birthday, February the 6th of 1998. And it was hard enough for me to face my birthday mm. every year. And I never wanted to own up to the date that I was raped with. As long as I kept it in the back forefront of my brains, I didn't have to deal with another date of knowing that this day is going to come around and I got to remember or uh, face that darkness of being raped on April the 10th of mm -hmm. 1998. This is the first time I've ever shared that date. I've always framed it as saying I was raped on uh, Friday, Easter Sunday weekend at Department of Public Safety. My sister died that Easter Sunday. I was raped that Friday. That Friday happened to be April the 10th of 1998. So you weren't allowed to even go and uh, uh, to your sister's services? Well, I was allowed to go to my sister's services. I was raped and tortured with the glass salt shaker that Friday morning, April the 10th of 1998. Mm -hmm. I was always raped on a Thursday or Friday. I was, I was able to go see my sister that Friday morning, but I was raped mm -hmm. with the glass salt shaker to go see her in the hospital before she died. That was the price I had to pay uh, that this guy, Donald Reed Conquer, and shoved this glass salt shake up my vagina, cut me, hurt me. And I can remember, Mr. Muhammad, when I wanted to see my sister, I uh, had to run into the bathroom and 
pad my underwear because I was bleeding so bad. And all I could think about was going to see this last sister that was dying in the hospital. So that Friday, April the 10th of 1998, I was raped, sexually assaulted by Donna Reed Cochran at the Department of Public Safety. I was raped so many times at the Department of Public Safety that uh, I can't even count them. But I remember the two significant dates was my birthday, February the 6th of 1998, and also I was raped April the 10th of 1998 at the Department of Public Safety, 575 East 36th Street North, to say goodbye to El Weeder. My older sister, when my father walked off and left my uh, siblings, it was eight of us, and I'm the seventh child, I felt compelled to go say goodbye to her because that's the least I could do. Had no clue that I was gonna be tortured to say goodbye to El Weeder. So in, in dealing with all of this, women behind the prison walls suffer a lot of abuse. Women are uh, uh, attacked uh, when they raped by state uh -huh. driver's examiners or prison guards. They cry as fall on death ear. It's because our courts and our system is not set up designed to protect the women because they feel like that when women are in prison and they made a mistake, who's going to believe them? Who's going to hear them? And so I have fought so hard and I've been fighting for 25 years. I promised God that I would never give up. I promised myself, my family, and many victims around the world that's incarcerated in prison that I know many rape stories. I know women that got pregnant behind the prison walls. I know mm -hmm. women that are being tortured because of their mistake they made. And until we change the way the uh, state systems uh, treat inmates, start prosecuting more of these perpetrators. And, and let me say this to you, Mr. Muhammad, mm -hmm. until how courts take a closer look at black women being raped and abused by perpetrators such as judges, law enforcement, that's raping us, and then they being shielded and protected by the good old boy club until somebody like FBI agencies get involved in criminal justice and look at the cries of black women. How many black women are raped and abused and our cries go unheard? We live in the state of Oklahoma, our governor and our state officials went off and left over 7,000 800 untested rape kits just sitting on the shelf. And guess how many of them look like Miss Pam Smith? 80% of these women that were violated and their DNA is just sitting on the shelf because they don't care. Women, most of these women were African American women. Their DNAs have expired. They have died. A lot of them, they went off and, and just simply didn't care. In the state of Oklahoma, you'll find black women cannot get help. They simply don't believe that in the state of Oklahoma, women can be raped and our voices can be heard. But I'm going to change that. And today, as I've said and I promise God, with shows like uh, Mr. James Muhammad and the Final Call and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, my sisters and brothers standing behind me, I am forever grateful. Sisters behind the prison walls, hold tight. Don't ever give up. Stay uh, in your faith. Stay encouraged and know that when somebody violates you, it's called rape. Okay. It's not sex for favors, it is called rape. The state statute says that if someone rape you in authority over you, they are raping you. You have no power to consent to anything. Sex with an inmate is not consensual sex, it is rape. Mm -hmm. If you're a state employee or anybody over authority as a custodian over these women, you raping them, you violating them. Okay, thank you, my sister. Brothers and sisters, I hope you're listening. We're here at the Self-Improvement Basis for Community Development Talk Show. I'm sitting here with my sister, Pamela Smith. She's going over her story as she, it relates to the final call issue, women in prison suffering and abuse. My sister, as you were speaking, how long did you have to work into the work release program? I worked in the work release program for close to 10 months. 10 months. Now, every time you needed something, it sounds like he wanted to rape you right. to supply that need right. for you. I didn't have very many needs. It was the fact that he was a racist man. Department of Public Safety knew Donna Reed Cochran was a guilty man. He had raped other women when he was a fireman or uh, 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 law enforcement at other facilities before he came to Department mm -hmm. of Public Safety. So it wasn't that anything that it was just 
that particular day or any day that he wanted to violate me, mm -hmm. and I would go and tell state employees mm -hmm. that he was raping me and violating me, and they would laugh in my face. I even went and showed the state driver's improvement guy mm -hmm. the condom that he gave me and raped me on my birthday, February the 6th of 1998 with. So I couldn't get help. I went to everybody I could at the Department of Public Safety, told the head supervisor, Ed Spencer, I was being raped on February the 18th. Of 1998, I told Ed Spencer, Donna Reed Cochran raped me and gave me a condom, and I took the condom and hid it in some bullets and trying to get some help. Ed Spencer told me to my face and the courts that he thought it was a joke. So it's yeah. okay to rape us black women, and it's a joke. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, <clears throat> with your case, when was the first time <clears throat> that it got into the courts and someone actually heard your cry and began to look at it from a legal standpoint? My first time my case was heard was January the 4th of 2004 in the Northern District in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Judge H. Dale okay. Cook. I went before Judge H. Dale Cook uh, in a civil trial. This case was uh, uh, heard, actually, it went to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeal uh, in Denver, Colorado, August the 12th of 2003, mm -hmm. I made a major ruling at the 10th Circuit Court of Appeal. It was stemmed to 42 USC 1983. What a victory for okay. inmates all around the world. So I made a major ruling August the 12th of 2003. It came down to lower courts in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Donna Reed Cochran was trying to get qualified immunity. If you're not a guilty man, why do you try to seek qualified immunity? Mm -hmm. He got denied qualified immunity, meaning that he today and that's where we're at now, going for criminal charges on him and all these perpetrators for destroying evidence. But to answer your question, first time I was heard uh, in the courts was January the 4th of mm -hmm. 2004 in H. Dale Cook's court. I went to a civil trial. The glass salt shaker wasn't there. An all-white jury told the uh, uh, jurors, all-white jurors, to look at him and then look at her and decide who's lying. They couldn't say look at the glass salt shaker. They couldn't say look at the evidence because the glass salt shaker that was delivered into the district attorney's office by Lieutenant George Randolph that went out and retrieved the glass salt shaker at Department of Public Safety in 1999 took the glass salt shaker once I identified it and the first time I seen that glass salt shaker was when he brought it to me after he went, Lieutenant George Randolph, and retrieved it at the uh, DPS, Department of Public Safety, found it, brought it to Pamela Smith to identify it. I asked Lieutenant George Randolph, okay. what were you gonna do with this glass salt shaker once I identified it? He said, I'm taking it to the district attorney's office for criminal charges. He took it for criminal charges in 1999, and the glass salt shaker came up intentionally destroyed by state officials. And the reason why, it had DNA on it. When Lieutenant George Randolph picked it up at the Department of Public Safety for me to, and brought it to me to identify it, he then went in his right coat pocket in a mm -hmm. tweed coat and brought it out in a sandwich bag and asked me, is this it? Before he brought it out, I identified it and described it to him. And when he brought it out, it was it. I said, what are you going to do with it? But before I asked him what was he going to do with it, I lost it. That glass salt shaker traumatized me. And when I seen it again, I had to go that day, Brother Muhammad, to go see the psychiatrist because I hadn't seen that. And it re I, I had to revisit pain, hurt, mm -hmm. and be traumatized all over. At the, at, and, and so when Lieutenant George Randolph picked it up and delivered it to the district attorney's office in Tulsa County, Tim Harris, for criminal charges in 1989, it's destroyed. In 2004, I go meet the district attorney and ask him, could he help me? Not to mention how many letters I wrote him from my prison cell begging him to put criminal charges on this man. Mm -hmm. But all these state officials couldn't help me. They all in bed with each other. They they friends. They go to church together. They go uh, golfing together. Here's a black woman going to pull down the establishment and this woman's telling the truth. You can't find a hole in Pam Smith's story. What woman want to chase this much pain? So when I went to court, I, at the civil trial, 
They told an all-white jury, look at her and look at him. The glass saw shaker wasn't there. The lieutenant that picked up the glass saw shaker, they made sure he was on another trial somewhere else, that he couldn't be there. Mm. However, could he be there in 2004 when the glass saw shaker was destroyed in 1999? Lieutenant George Randolph wasn't going to come and incriminate himself. So he didn't even show up for the civil trial. Mm -hmm. So when I went to that trial in 2004, I was treated worse than any. So cases. It was like I was in a house of getting ready to be executed. I'm looking for justice, mm -hmm. but sitting in a courtroom with judges and all these white people, the only person in this courtroom in Tulsa County uh, at the Northern District, everybody was white and I'm the only black person fighting for my life. And all I could sit there and think when I was looking at these white people and thinking, I'm believing y'all for justice. But I had to learn in life, even right don't always win. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, sister. You mentioned a letter that you received from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that encouraged you. You got it. Did you reach out to many black leaders, black organizations yes. to come to your aid? Did anybody respond? Also, did the correctional system, uh, the penal system, offer you any type of therapy or help? Never. Or never? Uh, I'll answer both of those questions. When I wrote the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan uh, in August, I believe it was August of 2004, he answered me in March of 2005, a few months later, he answered me. But before I wrote the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to ask him, and all I was asking him, I wasn't asking him for anything major like a lawyer or anything at that time. I was just asking him for guidance because I've always told he was a spiritual guidance person and would always give good you know, leadership in people that's lost or, and, and, and wouldn't judge me. So mm -hmm. I wrote uh, everybody, and uh, I wrote T.D. Jakes, I wrote Al Sharpton, I wrote Jesse Jackson, I wrote Oprah Winfrey, I wrote uh, uh, M. Fumi, I wrote, I could go on and on and on. And one day, I said, I'm going to write the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I sat down, and I wrote him, I drafted him, I drafted him a letter. And I told him, all I wanted him to do was to help me to get my story told from being in prison, mm -hmm. or being in prison because it would give me some guidance to help shine the light on other women being abused in prison. And that's what I was trying to do, mm -hmm. was stop the abuse for women being raped and abused mm -hmm. in the prison system. So he wrote me back. Yeah. And when he, he was the only one that wrote this letter mm -hmm. right here. And in this letter, that he wrote to me, he wrote and told me that God, Allah, will deliver and he cannot fail. And he told me to fight and hold on and go in whatever it takes to fight for your justice. And how do you fight for justice in an injustice system? And those words meant so much to me because those words in that letter has encouraged me has inspired me, and it's given me strength. And when the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan wrote that letter to me, mm -hmm. he was telling me then, I'm with you, daughter. And by him being with me, his followers have been with me. I can't, I can't thank y'all enough. I love my brothers and sisters in the nation. Y'all love make, you too. Y'all make me laugh. <laughs> y'all well, are so funny, and y'all are strong people, and you all help enrich me to stay strong. And I thank y'all so much, and I love y'all. Mm -hmm. All the Muhammads, all the Shabazzes, all of y'all, <laughs> all of y'all. Well, so you know, many of y'all. I noticed this part, and the letter said, unfortunately, we do not have any way to of putting your story on television. Ain't that something? But this television show was inspired by the study guides written by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan titled Self-Improvement, the Basis for Community Development. Mm. The show was set up for stories like yours, for black people who are suffering in our community, that we can get their story out to the public. Now with social media, not only would it be played on TV, it's being played Facebook Live, so the world will get to hear your story. So, Thank you, so much. you have the righteous behind you, and that's all you need. That's all I need. You know, but when I hear your story, I'm reminded of the story of Emmett Till and his mother, and many other black people who's going on before us who have suffered and fought for justice. But you're not just fighting for yourself, you're fighting for all those women who are locked up in the correctional system, in the penal system. 
Yes, I have been fighting for justice because I never thought myself that I'd be a victim of rape or sexual assault. And uh, I wasn't raped by a prison guard, but I was raped while I was in the care and custody mm -hmm. of the Department of Correction, like many of these women are. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of these women are broken, they carry uh, baggage around. They consider it as cons uh, collateral damage because the state allow men to abuse them. And when they walk out of prison, they don't have the direction because when they walk out, they not whole when they come out. And when they come out, they carry all that pain with them. And that pain that they carry with them cause them to relapse, cause them to go back to, to, to their criminal activities and mm -hmm. fall back into diverse temptation because of the abuse they suffered behind the prison walls and they never got the adequate help that they needed. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, they still carry the hurt and the pain until they address those pains uh, that they dealing with, and they can't because the same people that they are uh, they care deal with are the same men and women that are abusing them in the prison system. So they can't get help, and when they come out, they are lost because they have so much pain in them. And I want my sisters around the world to know that I thank God for the Nation of Islam, my sisters and brothers that's locked up in the prison institution. Stay strong, stay encouraged. Know that there are brothers and sisters that love you all, they don't judge you all. They want to help you guys. And that pain that you carry, we are your sisters and brothers keepers. We want to help you. I've been where you all are at. I know your pain. I know your suffering. I know what it's like to be raped. I know what it's like to be tortured. I know what it's like to be ignored. I know being a black woman and to think that white women get justice, but black women don't. Mm -hmm. And it appears that a white woman can drop a tear and she can get some help. Here's Pamela Smith raped and tortured with a glass salt shaker, shoved up her vagina to say goodbye to her dying sister. Many of my sisters are being tortured and abused and coming up uh, with babies while they're in the prison system and losing their children to the state because state officials are taking abuse of these women and raping them. So I want to say to my sisters, black women, we gonna get our justice. It's time for black women to rise up and stand up. And sisters, when somebody violates you and take something from you, you have the right to lift your voice and speak up. Don't be silenced in your abuse. You mm -hmm. cannot be silenced in your abuse. I know it hurt. It hurt me. But if I allow my pain and my silence to paralyze me, I couldn't be a voice for you. Uh -huh. Sister, when you was released, you was released with a lot of pain. You didn't go back to that old lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Something carried you over it. Mm. You better know it. <laughs> <laughs> My sister asked me before the show started, how far can I go with this story? What should I say, what I shouldn't say? I said, sister, I can't tell you how to express your pain. Right. Tell all the bad because the world need to hear what is going on. Mm -hmm. While we overseas trying to fight justice for other people, we're not getting justice right here in America. Exactly. So we're seeing it every day on the news, but now we're up close in person. I'm in the prison reform ministry. I go to the prisons. Don't forget about your family in the prison. I have people in my family that's been incarcerated. So, but how did you overcome and not go back and I see you still carrying a lot of hurt and pain because one thing to tell this story over and over again, you have to live it That's true. when you tell the story. What carried me was my faith and my family. Mm -hmm. Family and faith and strong supporters that encouraged me. Uh, I recall when I was incarcerated, I lost two sisters. Uh, one died in November, got killed in a car wreck, and then the other one died at the hospital of overdose of Ellaville's. And, and each one of those was, uh, I was going through some abuse at the Department of Public Safety. But through all of my pain that I went through, I had to give it to God. I had to give it to Allah. I couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. I, sum, I said, here, take this. But in order for me to be able to be a strong soldier, 
I had to lean up on my faith, faith and give it to God because I knew that what I had gone through, it wasn't a calling just for me. It was for something I had to do to help my other sisters to go through it. And I know that God can't send a soldier to the battlefield sick. Mm -hmm. So he had to get me well and help me to be able to fight. And the way he was doing that was strengthening me in the battle through, through to be tortured to know what it's like to be tortured and to be abused. And so I wanted to continue to uh, exercise my faith. And, uh, and I took God at his word. I took Allah at his word. Okay, I'm going to try you. You said you're going to bring me through this. Hmm. But I got to trust you. And I held on to my faith. I mm -hmm. held on to the unchanging hands. I had to go through being scandalized. I had to have the state officials to call me names. But it wasn't enough. I remember the promise that I made that I wasn't going to give up. <laughs> so I had to continue to fight that journey. And my message was to, the reason why I fight so hard, the FBI asked me this question mm -hmm. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Minister Jamal Ali with the Nation of Islam went with me, my brother, Minister Jamal Ali. We went to see the U.S. Attorney in Tulsa, Oklahoma in October of 2018. He asked me two questions. He asked me two, more than two, but these was two significant questions. <laughs> he wanted to know, how did I get the evidence? Because I showed him the evidence. How did you get the evidence? The reason why he asked that, for 24, 25 years, they've been lying and said there wasn't no evidence. She mm -hmm. wasn't raped. She just making that up for money. Oh, she wasn't raped. Now, a lady raped with a glass salt shaker want to make that up. So when he asked me that question, because he had the evidence, I took it and showed it to him. Then he wanted to ask me what was driven me. And I said, God in faith. Hmm. They want to know what was driven me. And I turn and say to anybody today, hmm. what man would not encourage his wife, daughter or mother, to continue to fight a journey of justice if she was raped and abused and tortured with a glass salt shaker. Mm -hmm. As I say to the FBI and I say to the district attorney and I say to the governor, if I was your wife or your daughter and a black man raped you with a glass, white, raped them with a glass salt shaker or tortured them, what would that black man's faith be today? Would that white woman have to sit on the James Muhammad show talking today? Would she have to be out scandalizing herself, begging people to sign a petition to get justice? Mm -hmm. what, 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 where is black justice for black women in America? Let me ask you a question. So where are you at so far now with the case and uh, getting it back into the court system? I, talk with, I spoke with an attorney, Dr. Benjamin Chavis, mm -hmm. uh, had me on his show July the 16th mm -hmm. of 2021 with Let It Be Known. Dr. Benjamin Chavis had me on that show. And he came on and told me that he was going to get a team of attorneys, and he said it on live TV, this is not an idle threat, this is a promise. So he, I talked with a lawyer that he had uh, contacted out of Baltimore, Maryland, named uh, uh, Malcolm Ruff. And Malcolm Ruff told me about three weeks ago that, uh, three weeks ago that mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. the criminal charges still remains on this case go for them criminal charges. Mm -hmm. So I have filed everything I possibly could to, that's right on this case. I have petitioned every court. I filed my a writ to the United States Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which was, I, I even petitioned uh, John Roberts. This is the writ with all the evidence of the glass salt shaker in it. This is the evidence where the state officials backdated certificate of services. The state officials backdated a certificate of service and hid it in a federal judge's computer to to block me and impede me on my justice. So right now, not only can we get criminal charges on Donald Reed Conquering today, mm -hmm. we're gonna do it. This case should not have gone this far. The state officials should have put criminal charges on Donald Reed Conquering. Mm -hmm. They hid DNA, they hit the glass salt shaker, they hit the rapists, they took everything on Miss Pamela Smith's case and destroyed it. They started destroying everything to impede Miss Pamela Smith's justice in 1999. The glass salt shaker was destroyed. I walked out of prison in September. My prison file was destroyed. They destroyed the medical records where the doctor treated me. They destroyed everything. Uh, Oklahoma uh, uh, Highway Patrol did the investigative report. I did two polygraphs. They destroyed them. I did investigative reports. The OSBI report for the DNA. Where is all these reports? Why are y'all destroying evidence on this case? Now, surely y'all not running from this little old 
former mm -hmm. crackhead, this old former uh, inmate, but just saved by grace. What are y'all afraid of? I stood on truth. I stand on the side of righteousness. I stand on what God represents. Allah on. is truth. Let me, okay, now, sister. Woo. One thing, you have a memory like an elephant. Because <laughs> my sister, you can, I've been, I, I was introduced to you a couple of months ago. And one thing I noticed, that you are consistent. Oh, yeah. I know it hurts to go over this story over and over again, but it's necessary. Yes, it is. Are there any other sisters who have the same, have filed the same complaint against this particular man? Yes. Candace Rowe was 15 and a half years of age. She went to the uh, Department of Public Safety. She went to school. Her name is Candace, and uh, she's all on my page. Uh, Y'all can find her. She was 15 and a half years of age. She went to school that morning, to, and Donna Reed Cochran went over to the school to administer a test to her. Mm -hmm. And he told her she failed the test at the school, ordered her to come to the Department of Public Safety, 575 East 36th Street North. Candace Rowe went over there to the Department of Public Safety the next day. This is in September of 1997. My rape started in November of 1997. So you see, he still hadn't learned anything because he had pre previously raped and violated women in other counties when he was in law enforcement. So when Candace Rowe arrived at the Department of Public Safety, 575 East 36th Street North, to do the written test again, court records prove, I repeat, court records prove Candace Rowe never failed either one of those tests, either at the school and neither at the Department of Public Safety. He told Candace Rowe that she failed the test. He ordered her to go back into the office of one of the buildings. He locked the door and told her he sat on the desk and positioned himself to rape Candace. He told Candace, what would you do if I tell you you failed? She said, I failed anything. Do you want some money? He said, no, I want to have sex with you. Candace was 15 and a half years of age. The FBI failed us black girls. Y'all talk mm -hmm. about these gymnastic girls who the FBI and all these people failed. What about Pamela Smith and Candace Rowe and black women? How about us? Mm -hmm. Candace Rowe was a child. You don't like little girls in state buildings in a uniform and a badge and ask them for sex in exchange for a grade. That's extortion. That's kidnap. Mm -hmm. You torture Pamela Smith with a glass salt shaker, the same man at Department of Public Safety. Women were coming in Department of Public Safety to get their driver's license, their CDLs, their permits, and he was asking them for sex in exchange. He would tell them that they failed their written test, and he would ask them for sex. Everything that I'm telling you guys today on Facebook Live and on the James Muhammad Show today, the Nation of Islam, I've told it to the FBI, I've told it to the Inspector General, my truth don't change and neither does my pain. Donna Reed Cochran should have been held accountable, charges. Candace Rowe made a police report. They ignored her police report. They didn't make a police report for Payon Smith. So we don't make a police report for Payon Smith. If we don't make a police report for Payon Smith, that means it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Remember I told y'all we were destroying all these field files. So if we don't make a police report, and when she come out of prison in September of 2000, we just gonna make sure everything she's destroyed in 1999, and we're gonna call her a liar. We're gonna even call her Jezebel. So a black woman can be raped and tortured by a white state driver's examiner at the Department of Public Safety in the black part of town, terrorize little young girls, ask women for sex in exchange for grace, and us black women have to be lying, and we have to be uh, uh, called Jezebels, and we have to be doing this for money. As I say it today, and I say to you all today, it's not enough money in the world that I would take for the pain that I have suffered. It wasn't so much as just the glass salt shaker that was shoved up my vagina that cut and hurt me. It's the extra pain that the state has imposed on me. They know mm. the truth. They know the truth, but they wanted me to go away. They wanted me to die. They wanted me to get on crack cocaine. Wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> I am saved by grace. All right, sister. Well, first of all, sister, thank you once again for coming on the Self-Improvement Basis for Community Development Show. This will not be the last time. We have to keep up with this story. We thank the Final Call newspaper. We also thank the honorable members of Louis Farrakhan, yes. also our, our brothers and sisters in the nation's law. Uh, from the magazine Rise, get your issue of the Rise magazine. Also, go on Amazon. This book should be read to our young sisters. It, re it really should be read to our young sisters. Also, 
the new Black Panther. Uh, Party magazine. magazine is her, her your magazine coming out. Coming out. All Teresa right. Teresa Hill uh, is featuring this magazine at my march in Tulsa. Okay. Uh, the Nation of Islam stands with me, walk with me, and they'll be walking with me in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tell us about when this is going to happen. That's going to happen March the 11th and 12th mm -hmm. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They're going to be marching. The Panthers are coming in. My brother, Minister Jamal Ali, Dr. Abdul came to Tulsa and walked with me and stood mm -hmm. with me. So on March the 11th and 12th in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Panthers are coming in to rally for justice for Queen Mother Pamela Smith in the state of Oklahoma. They're coming in from everywhere. But this is Teresa Taylor. She lives in Chicago and she's featuring me. They're going to debut my own magazine, as y'all see right here in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, at the march in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, I want you to do me a favor because we want to promote the march. When you get back home, I want you to get with those uh, that you're working with. We like to go via Zoom and uh, talk about the uh, march and how can we be a part and help. Okay. can send it out through America. Okay. So people can come from all walk of life to get in the march and, okay. and support you. Teresa you Hill. Teresa. I mean, excuse me, Teresa Taylor. Teresa I know Taylor. Her here. Teresa Taylor, that's the information that she's getting ready to send you. Okay. She's in Chicago. She's up there with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan mm -hmm. and all of them. So you get that information to Sound her. like the minister have touched you in a very special place. <laughs> oh, I love the minister and his wife. I sent them books. And you know what? If I never meet him, I met his followers, mm -hmm. and I'm grateful for y'all. Yes, I love y'all so much. Y'all, y'all just. Sister. I can I can have a little down moment, and I look on my Facebook page, <laughs> and one of my brothers being said something so sweet to me. I mean, mm -hmm. just so kind. Y'all the kindest people, and uh, one time somebody came on my Facebook page a long time ago and said something ugly, and one of the brothers came and said. That'll no, never you don't happen do again. That. You <laughs> no, don't they do don't that. let people no, come exactly. on, they run them off. <laughs> we will team up on you. We will team they up ran, on you. They ran them off. And I I never, and everything, every, that's been like five or six years ago. And mm -hmm. I said, boy, them Nation of Islam brothers, they love them from Miss Pam, but I love them. But yes, I love the Honorable Minister Louis Frecon. And the reason why I love him is because of this. He helped a woman that was broken. He didn't know nothing about me. He didn't even have to write me. Mm hmm the ones that was called they self civil rights leaders, when the cameras were rolling, they there, I'm sorry, I say what it is, I speak my mind. When the cameras were rolling, there they are. Mm -hmm. This man wrote me back, didn't even know me. He wanted to know what he could do. He offered guidance for me. And all I was asking the same thing, but no, they didn't come to my rescue and help me. And so I love him that the fact that the guidance he gave me, the words he held, uh, depositing me has inspired me to keep fighting, mm -hmm. to know that uh, what he said to you all was, uh, I have endorsed her by sending this letter to her, telling her to fight. Mm -hmm. And it was ironic about four or five years ago, I made a video and I cried out to the Honorable Minister Louis Frecon just talking to him. Went to bed that night, and through the night, my phone was just ding, 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 ding. I got up and said, Lord, what is all of that? Mm -hmm. It was brothers sending me friend requests from everywhere. Mm -hmm. I said, Lord, have mercy. Look at God. Look at Allah. So I'm just grateful, and I'm thankful. And uh, again, I, I love him and his family. And uh, meeting you is such an honor. And yes, I, I just thank you so much, James. I'm honored to be uh, here with say, you, sister. They said that you could do this interview virtual. I said, oh no, I'm going to him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you came to me. I'm glad I met you. My, My sister friend. drove all the way from Tulsa, Oklahoma. For those who just now tuning in to the Self-Improvement Basis for Community Development talk show, I am honored. So honored to have my sister come to Memphis to be on the Self-Improvement Show to share her story with us. A sister begging for justice, Sister Pamela Smith. You're going to hear more about because we're going to play this. We're going to make sure the world hear this story, my sister. I thank all of those for tuning in on Facebook Live. Make sure we share this story. It's a part of the Prison Reform Ministry. It will be on their page too, my sister. But I thank you for coming, sister. Thank I you really so thank much, you. We James. love you. Okay. We're here for you. We will fight with you. And make sure we know about the march that is coming up in a march so we can be a part and also help publicize it to my okay. sister. Now, I can't leave without 
you talking to our women out there and, uh, and say a, you know, a few words to them and uh, we're the inspiration, my sister. I'm going to let you close out the show, all right? Okay, let me dry my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to my sisters that's locked up behind the prison walls, mm. I am Miss Pamela Smith. I've been fighting for 25 years. My cry and my fight has been for you. I want you to hold your heads up. I want you to stay encouraged. I want you to know you're not alone. But what I do want you to do is don't come out of prison the same way you went in. Mm -hmm. You must change. Change comes from within. You can't do the same things you did, girls, that took you to prison and exact and expect change. It won't happen. I had to change. I was tired of hurting my family. I was tired of lying to my family. Mm -hmm. Your children need you. Your mother and grandparents are tired of raising you. It's time for you to pull yourselves up by the bootstraps, swallow your pride, and get yourself together. We all make mistakes. I was on crack cocaine. I was guilty as charge when I went to prison. Prison saved me. People say, how do you say that? Because had I not went to prison, I don't know where I would be. Mm. I was not robbing banks or doing nothing but drugs to take you in a direction that you don't want to go. Mm -hmm. And I thank God that I ended up in prison. It gave me time to think. So sisters, while you sitting in prison and you have time on your hand, reflect on doing the things that's right to come out of prison. And as I say to you all, you have people that's there for you. Don't feel like that you're entitled to things because you made a mistake. A lot of girls in prison feel like they're entitled to uh, things when they come out. The world owe them nothing. The world don't owe us nothing. When I came out of prison, I had a made up man and a determination that I was going to change. I was tired of hurting my family. My family need me. Your family needs you. Change, girls. And know that Miss Pamela Smith is out here fighting for you and continue to hold your head up and stay encouraged okay i love you all much love pamela smith well sister thank you for coming on the self-improvement thank you basis sir. for a community development talk show thank you all for tuning in facebook live until the next time may god be with you and if you need us just call us until then brothers and sisters peace be unto you i